All right, good evening, beloved New York City Bar colleagues and friends. My name is Sheila Boston, and I am the president of the New York City Bar Association, AKA the Bar of Hope. I am also the first woman of color president of the New York City Bar Association in its 150 year of existence. Um, I'm so excited. We just ended Black History Month, and now here we are at the, the beginning of women's month so happy women's month to everyone this march um i'm just excited and thrilled because this is the inauguration this is the first night um, of a new presidential series which i've entitled raising the bar of hope yes it's a play on our nickname the bar of hope you get it right awesome well this is programming to highlight and examine issues challenging black females both women and girls and the goal is not only to try to be creative, well, the goal is not only to highlight the issues or the problems, if you will, but also to be creative and actually find solutions, okay? This is about solution finding as well. And I'm just excited because frankly, I wanted to use this platform as president of this wonderful institution to be able to highlight this particular demographic, because in my opinion, it is too often we are as black women and girls marginalized, ignored, and undervalued. So I wanted to take this time to make sure that we spent some time um, looking at issues that especially have had a tremendous impact and effect on us. Um, but again, it's not going to just be about the issues. I have also, and especially in the future programming, we are going to celebrate, okay, some of the accomplishments as well. Uh, this is a part of a diversity, equity, and inclusion program, if you will, but it's a lot more. I will remind everyone I have six pillars for my presidency, that which the whole group, my whole New York City posse, if you will, is concentrating on. Diversity, equity, and inclusion, mental health and wellness, um, COVID-19 recovery projects, access to justice, criminal justice reform, and protection of the rule of law. And again, this programming is not just about diversity, equity, inclusion. It is, I think, also about access to justice and other issues. And we'll be having more programming. But tonight, the inaugural event, this program is entitled Over-Policing of Black Girls in Schools. And I have to give a big shout out and hearty congratulations and note of appreciation to the Education and the Law Committee of the City Bar. They are chaired by Jerry and James and Evan Rosenberg. I wanna also give a shout out to Kendall Ruther Grant, who's a member of that committee and worked so hard to get this together. Co-sponsoring committees, you know I love you, Children and the Law, Civil Rights Council on Children and Juvenile Justice. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And with that, I'm just excited to have a vision come to fruition. I need to go so that you can hear from our wonderful panelists. We have experts here tonight. We are also hopefully going to have a young lady who is courageous and inspirational, and she's gonna share her story with us so we can learn from it. But without further ado, I am going to turn over the virtual stage to none other than Professor Alexis Carteron. Take it away, ladies. Thank you so much for that wonderful and energetic introduction. Um, thank you to everyone who's joining and attending. Um, I wanna start with something that's a little boring, but it's important for all the lawyers who are interested in CLE credit. Um, and I hope we have some non-lawyers here too, but for the lawyers looking for CLE, please listen carefully. You should have received an email confirmation, which included two attachments. The first attachment is an evaluation that you will need to complete at the end of the program. The second attachment is an affirmation that you will also need to complete at the end of the program. The affirmation will ask you to include two CLE tracking codes. We will announce both CLE tracking codes during the program. We ask that you make note of those codes when they are announced. I'm gonna say that again. I'm going to announce two CLE tracking codes during the program. Please make note of those codes when they are announced. Once you have completed the evaluation and the affirmation, please return them by email to customerrelations at nycbar.org. That email address is also included in your confirmation. Once the city bar receives your affirmation and evaluation, they will send you your certificate by email within five business days. Okay, now that we've got the CLE business out of the way, I want to start with short introductions of our wonderful panelists this evening. 
First, we have Dr. Jamelia Blake. She's a professor and licensed psychologist in the Department of Educational Psychology at the College of Education and Human Development Studies at Texas A&M University. Her research, which is really essential to this conversation, examines the developmental trajectory of peer-directed aggression, bullying, victimization, and socially marginalized youth and racial ethnic disparities in school discipline. She has been extensively published on the social and psychological consequences of aggression and victimization in black girls in particular. And there are more details about her and the rest of our panelists as well in your materials. Uh, she will be speaking about how black girls are seen, who they actually are, and give us some historical perspective on how black girls have been treated over many decades by our educational and criminal legal system. Karen Ame is a 19-year-old Hunter College student and portrait artist. She grew up and attended school in Brooklyn, and she will be sharing some of her personal experiences with us that are relevant to this conversation as well. Ashley Sawyer is the Senior Director of Campaigns at GGE, Girls for Gender Equity in Brooklyn. She uses multiple forms of advocacy to improve and advance the opportunities and well-being of young people, especially cis and trans youth of color, through city and state policies, coalition work, and legislative advocacy. Particularly relevant to our conversation tonight, she has experience representing youth facing school suspension hearings and has previously led reentry work for girls and female identified youth incarcerated on Rikers Island. Dr. India Tusi is an associate professor of law at Delaware Law School. Her research examines racial and sexual hierarchies as they relate to policing, race, and gender. She has extensive experience at organizations addressing civil and human rights issues like the American Civil Liberties Union, Human Rights Watch, the Center for Constitutional Rights, and the Opportunity Agenda. She'll be talking to us about the aftermath of these experiences with policing in schools for Black girls. So um, just to kind of remind us of why we're all here, uh, I was thinking about the fact that every once in a while you see something in the news you see a really disturbing story about a black girl who has been treated very badly by police in her school. One episode that always sticks with me was a story out of Columbia, South Carolina, where there was a girl who had a cell phone in school, something that of course, millions of girls around the United States do all the time, have their phone in school, maybe when they're not supposed to. But this girl ended up being brutalized by a police officer who was in her school. And when you see footage like that, you see this violence taking place at a place that's supposed to be a safe haven for all students. It really is shocking. But it also reminds us that there are millions and millions of Black girls in particular across the United States who are subjected to this kind of treatment every single day. Um, so we're going to start by having Professor Blake take just 30 seconds to maybe a minute um, to give us a grounding because we are talking about some disturbing material tonight. Um, and then she's going to go on to talk to us about why policing, the policing black girls is a subject that's worthy of discussion. Dr. Thank Blake. You. Thank you. So we're gonna be talking about some um, issues that may uh, make you feel a level of distress or uncomfortable. Um, and what we really want you to think about is reflecting on how salient these issues are. Um, if you feel that you're, if you feel overwhelmed by the content, take a deep breath, take a step back, but really just kind of sit with it and consider it. But some of the topics in the um, issues we're going to discuss may be somewhat disturbing, but we have to have these discussions um, in order to move us forward and have progress. Thank you. And if you could um, go on to tell us about your expertise in the treatment of Black girls um, in the historical, giving us a historical perspective on how we've landed in this place where unfortunately we hear these stories time and again of Black girls being very seriously mistreated in school. Yes, so um, first I wanna ground us in not only the history of just Black girls treatment, but the history of um, black girls involvement with educational disparities. I always say that this is something that's hiding in plain sight. So we have more than 30 years. We're talking about it now and it's so important that we're raising awareness, but black girls have been over-disciplined and over-policed for more than 30 years. There have been scholars who've been studying this for decades and decades. Their experiences, unfortunately, have been masked 
um, because we tend to focus on black males or students with disabilities and not look at the unique experiences of black girls. But what re so, so my expertise is clearly studying um, discipline disparities in black girls, um, contact with the criminal justice system and really what drives that process. Like what's happening that makes um, these young girls uh, constantly have contact because when we hear the narrative, we often hear black girls are, are doing well academically. They're very successful. Um, they become professional black women. And so what was not aligning in my own personal experiences is how could black girls be doing so well in terms of educational attainment, but still having, um, being over suspended and having um, significant contact with school resource officers and police. And really, um, this is rooted in our historical relationship, right, and, and white supremacy, right? And the fact that uh, Black children were never really ever treated like Black children. We've always been dehumanized, and that started with slavery, right? And so when you look at Black girls in school, what's really happening is that the stereotypes that we have about Black women that arise from slavery, right, that we're aggressive, that we're hypersexual, right? Um, even the extent to that we are these caretakers that are not sensitive to harm. We're kind of this invulnerable, impenetrable force, this entity, right? Those stereotypes of Black women really um, have trickled down and have always kind of enveloped the experiences of Black girls. So what's happening to Black girls in the school system when they're interacting with police, or not even just in the school system, outside in the community, we can think of numerous cases where law enforcement has used force, significant force for very minor um, interactions or misunderstandings. It's really this idea of adultification bias, seeing Black girls as adult women and, and mapping those stereotypes, right? Those racist stereotypes about Black women onto Black girls. So this is something that Black girls have always struggled with. We are just now finding terminology and we're just now highlighting their experience. So it's about time is what I always tell my students. It's, it's our time. It's about time that we recognize the vulnerability of Black girls and how the world sees them, regardless of how they behave, regardless of what they do or what they say, the, the response to, um, I sometimes tell my colleagues, just me breathing is an act of resistance. Just my very existence is an act of resistance. And that's often what happens with Black girls, them raising questions in the classroom, them asserting themselves is seen as an act of resistance of defiance that needs to be controlled. And so in addition to these stereotypes, they're also constantly surveilled. We talk to Black girls often, they talk about this idea of always being watched, always being monitored for any small slight interaction is perceived as threatening or intentional. And the response is very punitive um, because we're not seeing them as children. We're not seeing their actions as, as something that you would make a mistake, what kids do. We don't give black girls the benefit of the doubt or black boys for that matter, but we don't give black girls the benefit of the doubt. And so when, um, police and educators respond to them, they're responding based on those stereotypes and this need to control Black people in general. So they respond with force and they respond more punitively. Thank you so much. Um, you said so much that's so interesting. Um, and I think there's a lot to unpack there. Um, you know, you mentioned the idea of Black girls' vulnerability and seeing their vulnerability and how we're basically, we're not kind of trained to see black girls as vulnerable um, because of so many stereotypes um, and other sources of discrimination. Are there sources of vulnerability for black girls that are you know, particular to black girls that you could share with us? That's a really good question. So I don't, I don't fully know the answer, but what I will say is what's unique and honestly just really disappointing is in the work that I've done on adultification bias is that adults are seeing black girls as being more adult-like, right? So knowledge about sex, independent, 
you know, not having this vulnerability or this childhood innocent as young as age five. Right, so that is very unique to black girls in that we are robbed our childhood and you don't necessarily see that perception or that interaction with any other girls of color, at least that I'm aware of that we've not found yet, not to the magnitude that we see it for black girls. So that's unique that, that not that there's something inherently vulnerable in black girls, there's something inherently wrong with our society and the way we perceive black girls and their behavior. You know, um, one of my favorite scholars, um, she wrote, Janet Helms would say, let's start diagnosing communities and stop diagnosing kids, right? And so it's not black girls and that, that they're vulnerable, it's our society and the deficit-based perspective that we have on them at such a young age that it's, it's kind of like they can't even begin the race because if you're if you think of a five year old as really knowing about sex and hypersexualized and being independent, how then can you educate and support that girl in her development? You can't if that's how you see them because you're expecting them to know. So I would say that's the part that is distinct about their experience. That's really just shocking to hear out loud, even though you know it's something that as a black woman it sounds familiar to know to in it's nice to for those of us who aren't psychologists and don't have your expertise to know what the name of it is it's adultification bias um, and obviously we're talking about the impact on girls and schools and how that affects their education I wondered if you could expound a little bit on how those experiences in school reverberate throughout black girls lives as they become actual adults not when they're five-year-olds but when they actually become adults how does that affect them long term I think that's a really good question. I think we're still trying to uncover it, but when we talk retrospectively, right? So what was really powerful about the work that I did on adultification bias is the number of black women <laughs> who reached out to me who said, you have captured what I was going through. And I think that it does a few things. I think that one, it creates this um, sojourner feeling that we, we have to always, um, be strong and independent and resilient that we kind of it kind of pushes us into these stereotypes that we don't we don't mean to take on but it's this idea that we can't be vulnerable and I think as as black women that that impacts our health our physical health right in the sense that we're taking on kind of being the caretaker for everyone and not showing this vulnerability and not being protected so I think that happens um, subconsciously without even our awareness because of this idea of adultification bias. And it can be, I wanna say adultification bias can be harmful, but it can also come, it can also be nuanced, right? Like you can take it, you can do it, you can handle it, you know, and, and, and putting this on black girls at developmentally inappropriate ways. But it also can result in a distrust, right? And a disengagement from academics, right? So if, if everything I do is perceived as bad or intentional, right? Or if me raising my hand is seen as an act of resistance or being defiant, if me answering your question, right? So I get this a lot with young black girls, even my children, I have to tell my kids, this is a rhetorical question. This is not a rhetorical question because they start to get confused because you know, adults react differently saying that, oh, well, you're being defiant, you're being disrespectful. When, when you keep getting that feedback that there's something about you that's wrong, most people disengage at some level and we can disengage at, at different levels. Some people can completely withdraw and not study, not work for that teacher. Other people are not showing their full selves. But I think what it does is it, it robs us of joy. I say this in every presentation, but my youngest story is always like, mom, can I live? You know, cause I'm always in the store like, don't you touch that, send them, okay, watch, you know, cause they're looking and this might happen to you because I'm so worried, you know, and I tell her, I'm not worried about you. I'm worried about society. Like I'm worried about what happens when I leave you in the mall, how you're gonna be treated and they're not gonna see you as 15 year old carefree girl who's just hanging out with her friends. You know, you know they're gonna see you as a threat, right? So. I think it robs us of the innocence, the, the, the carefreeness. And I think we carry that as women, 
right? In that we always have to be on and we always have to have a guard up because we're not allowed again to be vulnerable. And I think it also impacts the way some of us interact in certain institutions and systems because if every time I raise my hand, if every time I ask a question, that's gonna activate those stereotypes where, well, it's better for me to kind of just push through and be silent. So we don't get kind of this full experience. That's what I see happening. Thank you so much for that. Um, so you mentioned disengagement, which obviously is a particular concern when you're talking about school. I mean, it's really exactly the place where you want to see kids engage the most. Um, is there anything you can tell us about the presence of police in school that um, affects engagement or lack thereof for Black girls? That's a good question. I don't know if I can talk about it in terms of engagement, but I think that um, what Black girls say is that um, the police are constantly surveilling and controlling them, right? And so I think that there are you know, there's always going to be personalities, right? Like some people are going to push back against that, but other people are going to kind of avoid and move away from that. And so um, I don't know if I can completely answer that question about disengagement, but what I imagine is it's a lack of full participation in everything that's going on with school. And it's a lack of trust, right, in this system that are these individuals, you know, and this is historical in the black community, are they really here to protect me, right? If they're looking at everything that I do as problematic. Um, so I'm just going to reduce my contact and just kind of avoid, but where that gives me concern is that doesn't allow black girls to get the full educational experience, right? To fully engage in their classroom, to voice their opinions. Can y'all hear me? Okay, I have internet problems sometimes. So I will jump in here while Alexis. Oh, I think I'm, I'm back. Okay. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yes. Sorry, yes. technical Great. difficulties. Um, very sorry about that. So Dr. Blake, you mentioned the idea of constant surveillance and control um, you know, from police in schools which is something that sounds very familiar to me, um, having spent a lot of time representing kids in New York City who were subject to abuse by members of the NYPD School Safety Division. Um, and I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that, about the surveillance of the control and what forms um, that took. Um, you know, partly we had, at least in New York City, really formal control and surveillance in the form of metal detectors in some schools, for example. Um, you know, school safety agents roaming the hallways in a way that, as you suggested, really did not generate trust. It seems like there's been some, some change there in recent years, but still, I think there are a lot of concerns around that. Um, could you talk about that a little bit more? So I th think that the more formal forms of surveillance we know, right, that there's a lot of research that talks about just the presence of school resource officers, police officers, and it creates this idea. But with girls, I'm talking about just, it's like always being under someone's thumb, right? Always like when you look up, you know, my kids always say this, like, uh, it's, it's like from Friday, I don't know if you've read, but you know, when I'm in the kitchen, why are you in the kitchen, right? So when I'm looking up, why are you, why are you, why are we making eye contact? This, this constant presence, right? Where, um, and it doesn't always come in like this formal of, hey, you stop doing that. It's like a hand on your shoulder. You know, this constant person always kind of observing your interactions. And it's almost as if we're trying to catch you doing, you know, bad. I often tell teachers like your goal is to catch your students doing something good. But the surveillance is really like I'm going to catch or as the, the way the girls explain it to me and, and my own kids talk about it. I'm trying to catch you doing something bad. So I'm constantly feeling like I'm being watched, like I'm being monitored, even when there's no reason for this level of surveillance. So it's much more kind of nuanced and hard to, to measure and describe, but the kids talk about this, you know, 
constantly just kind of always kind of being looked at and you know there's someone very close there's you know they're close to them like so if the if the kids are congregating you know socially in the area suddenly you know school resource offices in proximity as if anticipating something is going to happen like you know you know utilizing those stereotypes about seeing black girls as aggressive or hypersexualized that they need to be there to monitor that and control that and so we see that with police but oftentimes that that's that policing is um pushed by educators right so it's the teachers that kind of also reinforce this idea and alert you know law enforcement that they need to be doing this so a lot of my work focuses on changing teachers and teachers bias because my experience dealing with school resource officers are that they don't really want to be they don't really want to handle some of these things and it's educators who are calling them in to intervene and then they're in this situation where they have and i'm not excusing law enforcement at all but i'm just saying from a perspective that a lot of times what we're missing is that administrators and teachers are driving um, the surveillance of law enforcement by the information that they're feeding them about girls and what they're doing and hey you need to come check this out because they're doing this and so that also builds into the surveillance so they're just not being surveilled by police they're being surveilled by educators as well i'm so glad you said that um and i couldn't agree more and something i heard over and over and over again that i had a client who you know a teacher called a school resource officer in because he wouldn't take his hat off at the blackboard there was a girl I'll never forget seeing the surveillance video of her refusing to put her tray away um, in the lunchroom she was a sixth grader and you know calling a school resource officer over to deal with that um, so i think it's a point that can't be emphasized enough the other thing that comes to mind is the idea you mentioned of surveillance and kind of let me live um, <laughs> and the idea that um, the mere presence has an impact and sometimes it's a harmful impact and very often what you hear about school resource officers is that they see themselves as you know part counselor part law enforcement you know they're not just police officers on the street they conceive of themselves differently um, you know the people who are big advocates for them, be them being in the schools conceive of them differently but it sounds like from what you're saying it doesn't necessarily mean that the kids the girls and boys see them that way yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm very glad that you emphasize that. Can I just add one more thing? I know that my time is short, but I, I, <laughs> I think that we have to think about how, what, how we see ourselves and how the world sees ourselves and what we're really prepared and trained to do. And I, I, I kind of take issue with this idea that school resource officers are like a counselor when we have counselors in schools and we, or let's just, I'm just gonna get a little bit of a soapbox where we won't fund to have more counselors and school psychologists and school social workers who are trained to listen to kids and to deal with and to help them with their mental health. So, so I think that that is problematic. Of course, any adult can be a support system to a kid, can be um, an advocate and a mentor, but that depiction is a falsehood. I mean, yes, maybe one or two kids talk to you, but you're not qualified to support children's mental health. And let's be honest, that's not why you're placed there. You're placed there as a, as a, a fear monger, as a mechanism of control to keep kids in line for supposed safety. You're not really there to counsel and support them. That's us rebranding that role, which I think is problematic. And we have to push back against. It's not that I don't appreciate their perspective, but I want people to, you know, just because you have the passion to do something, you know, doesn't mean that you're qualified to do that. And you may actually cause more harm. And we need to be honest about why school resources officers are placed in schools in general. It's out of fear, right? And it's a mechanism of control. And whether they want to be part of that or acknowledge that, that's fine. But that's the reality. That's why they got the job. Um, because, and I'm just, sorry, I'm just rambling, but this is like my soapbox, like let's put money in people who really are trained in mental health so that the kids can go to them and talk to them. So, I don't think you're rambling. I'd be, if that's rambling, I'd be ha happy to listen to you ramble all day. Thank you so much for offering your expertise and perspective on these important issues. So CLE lovers, pay attention. First code 
It's EDU030411. And I will say that again. CLE code number one is EDU030411. Okay. Um, so thank you so much again, Dr. Blake. Uh, I'd like to move on now to Karen. Are you there? Karen Amy? Yes, I am. Hi, thank you so much for being here um, and being willing to share your experiences with us. Um, as I said at the beginning, you're a recent uh, high school graduate and a college student now. Um, and we were hoping you could talk with us about your experience in your school in Brooklyn. Um, so I went to a high school in Brooklyn. I graduated in 2019. And I was kind of thinking as you guys were speaking about the point of like over policing and like the point of like hyper vigilance, I would say. So I'm gonna get a little anecdotal. And if there are any questions, you're free to like ask them while I'm speaking and I'll try to answer them. Um, so some things that were notable to me when I was going to high school was that I went to a school that was not predominantly black. My school was predominantly Asian, Middle Eastern, white. There were like, I would say five, between five and 10 black students in my grade. And there were even less in other grades. So um, one thing I noticed very early into my freshman year was that um, people tended to make certain jokes towards black women more than they made other jokes towards other people. Like for example, I would raise my hand in class or I would like correct someone about like being wrong about something and other people would correct them and it would just, their word would be taken for it. They would be respected. They would be, hmm, maybe you stated something that I missed. But with me, it was always, why are you trying to take control of the group? And whenever I would speak up for the group because nobody else wanted to speak up, it was like, oh, well, it's the strong black woman who's like, they would always make jokes saying, oh, you're a strong independent black woman, so this should be fine. And it would just kind of be like, what, what does me being black have to do with any of this? It was like, I was like the designated speaker for everyone, but at the same time I would get mocked and made fun of for being the designated speaker for everyone. And I kind of like grew more and more uncomfortable with them as like the years went by. Um, I was sexually assaulted at the end of my freshman year. And there were some other numerous sexual assault cases going, coming from my high school. But with mine, it was it was a little different. It was kind of like everyone else, they would talk about how they felt bad for them or they would at least give those women an opportunity to voice their stories. But with me, it was immediately that they shouldn't be surprised because I was expected to be more sexually active at a younger age than everyone else was. And they kind of viewed us as like viewed black women specifically as like sexually voracious promiscuous more doing more at a younger age and we were kind of like an experiment for them which made me like really uncomfortable and I started like speaking up about that weird culture and it would kind of be like my voice was only valued when it wasn't used to speak up for Black people or Black women. My voice was valued when someone else was picking on someone else because they would send me to speak up for them like I was an attack dog. But when I spoke up for myself, it was kind of not everything's about race, you're doing too much. Um, basically, I kind of learned that my voice is a weapon and it only matters when it's used by non-Black people. So our voices are amplifiers, megaphones for other people's agendas, but not for us saying that we're hurting, 
not for us saying that this isn't right and we shouldn't have to continue to deal with this thing. Not for us asking for help. There were countless times that I asked for help when I was being assaulted and when I tried to share my story because my abuser was able to stalk, harass, and sexually assault me for four more years after the initial assault. Nobody else's abuser was allowed to do that to them. And another notable thing was my abuser was a Black man, yeah, but he only sought out Black women because he knew nobody cared about us. With everyone else, once word got out about their sexual assault or their sexual harassment, everyone was checking to make sure they were okay. Everyone wanted to know that they were safe, that they were coping with it all right, that they were supported. But with us, it was just like, well, you're a strong Black woman. You can take it. Or when we did speak up, it was always that we were speaking too loud. Always. We are always speaking too loud. And when I was younger, I always tried to like tone that down because I would raise my hand. And I've always been like a really active, like nerd kind of girl. Um, I would always raise my hand in class. I would never get chosen. And when I would get chosen, my answers could be the exact same as a white student. And I would still get told that's not exactly what we're looking for. Because Black students, Black female students, we're not allowed to play devil's advocate like white men are. We're not allowed to question authority because it's seen as threatening. It's seen as we're upsetting the status quo. It's seen as we're not following and adhering to our place in society, which is to only amplify the voices of other people. And I just, I grew very tired of it and it's made me so like insecure about speaking up for myself to the point where now in like normal conversation, I tend to feel more on edge when I'm not interacting with other black people because it's kind of like they have a certain image of me right before I speak but they don't have that image of other people before they speak when people hear me speak in conversation it's you're so well spoken it's oh I didn't expect you to speak like this wow you're so intelligent so it's kind of like what did you expect me to be did you expect me to only speak in ebonics because I'm a black girl did you expect me to not value my education and to not care about these things? Did you expect me to be dumb? They have certain expectations of us. And the difference between stereotypes of Black women and stereotypes of everyone else is that you can disturb those stereotypes of everyone else. And it's like a pleasant surprise. But when you disturb the stereotype of what a Black woman is supposed to be, that has to be neutralized and it has to be shut down very quickly because the stereotypes they have of black women are beneficial to society. Like I said, I was always nominated to be the group leader and to speak up for everyone in class when we do group projects. I never picked that role, but it was always pushed on to me. Our stereotype benefits everyone else. We're a scapegoat. We're supposed to automatically take on emotional labor for other people. And when push comes to shove, everyone leaves us out to dry. It's very, it's very lonely. Like I, even outside of the school environment, hyper policing of black women is everywhere. I used to walk into beauty supply stores and walk into Sephora with my friends. My Asian friends would be the ones stealing from the stores, but guess who was getting followed? It was me. I was getting followed. I was the one constantly being asked if I needed help. And it's just like what you guys said, that hand on the shoulder that's like, if you need anything, I'm here. But to us, what it really is, is I'm keeping my eye on you. extending a hand and offering support are not the same thing. And microaggressions 
experiencing so many microaggressions means that as a black woman, I know the difference between someone offering me a hand to keep an eye on me and offering me a hand to keep that hand in prison so they can make sure they know what I'm doing. <laughs> Thank you so much, Karen. Um, I think I speak for all of us. In fact, I know I speak for all of us when I say that we want you to keep using your voice. We don't want you to feel silenced. You have so much to say and it's so important. And we're so thankful that you're willing to share your experiences with this entire audience um, because that's a hard thing to do um, and to make yourself vulnerable and to talk about bad experiences, frankly, that sound like they came at the hands of both your classmates and your friends and also the adults in your building in the school building who were supposed to be there to protect you. Um, so can't thank you enough for being willing to speak with us here. And I hope you use your voice again and again and again in different areas of your life because everyone will be better off for it. Um, so, oh, Karen, do you wanna say anything else? Oh, I just wanted to say thank you for asking me to and allowing me to kind of like actually speak about this because it's kind of been something that I've always like felt for years, but it's always so difficult to vocalize. Well, you did an amazing job telling us all and making it really real for all of us who are listening to you. So thank you. We're very grateful. Okay, so back to the law and how the law, unfortunately, Let's this continue, how it really um, sustains this kind of violence, sustains this mistreatment. Um, so Ashley Sawyer is going to talk with us about that a little bit. Uh, Ashley? Thank you so much. I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to talk about this work. So I am going to just offer a little bit of context about what brings me to this work because I think it'll be helpful for giving um, direction to the remarks I'm going to make. So I started um, my work through direct practice as an attorney representing um, young people who had had experiences with the juvenile legal system in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania more broadly. Um, and who were being denied their education rights. And then I was able to do more policy advocacy focusing on the ways that black girls had experienced suspensions disproportionately in the school district of Philadelphia. And then um, I did more direct practice in New York City. And in those practices, I was doing a whole range of legal representation, including mitigation work for young people who had felony charges. And I would meet with them each week in their housing areas at Rikers. And I ended up focusing specifically on girls and femmes, young people who were non-binary, um, but who were gendered as girls by the state. Um, and so in addition to doing that criminal mitigation, I was also doing school suspension hearings and housing court hearings, et cetera. And in the course of that work, one of the things that continued to be so salient was that the criminalization of Black women and girls, and particularly of gender nonconforming and non-binary youth of color, Black youth in particular, were ignored from the broader conversation around the school to prison pipeline. Now in my current role at Girls for Gender Equity, our commitment is to ending sexual and gender-based violence and the ways and lifting up the ways that Black girls are imp impacted by gender-based violence in education and through the practice of criminalization. Over and over and over again, we consistently see that Black girls, much like what you heard Dr. Blake and Karen share, are adultified and surveilled. And when I use the term surveilled, I am talking about practices where young people Black people in particular are um, watched to see if they will do something wrong, where they are attending schools, where they have to go through metal detectors, where there is the presence of policing. When we look at affluent school districts, those students do not go through metal detectors every single day. Those students do not go to schools where they are constantly interacting with police or law enforcement. And I heard this phrase uh, years ago, I think at a convening that LDF put together, but when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So where there is the presence of law enforcement or policing, it is more likely that students will end up arrested, suspended, 
attacked or experiencing violence at the hands of the state. And when I say violence at the hands of the state, I mean law enforcement. So that is the context um, of what I will be trying to talk to you about. And I want to try to paint a picture about what this looks like in practice and what criminalization means. I am going to be very intentional about the words that I use to describe this work. And I do that because I think that part of my work is consciousness raising for attorneys, because we might be in our silos and we might be really concerned about what does the law say, but it's important to understand the human impact. How are people impacted by these systems? So I'm going to be using terms like gender non-conforming and non-binary because under the umbrella of Black girls at Girls for Gender Equity at GGE, where I work, we include and we make space for not only um, cisgender Black girls, but also trans Black girls and non-binary youth and youth who um, do not align with the old school understandings of gender. And I want to point out that those are actually students who were disproportionately suspended, expelled, arrested at school. I I would point folks to the scholarship of another lawyer, Fran Sherman from Boston Boston College, excuse me, whose research is about the overrepresentation of lesbian and bisexual girls and mask of center young people in the juvenile system. They make up over 40% of the young people who are criminalized. And so I think that that's appropriate context for the first anecdote that I will share with you. One of the young people that I had the honor of representing when I was doing direct practice at Youth Represent was a young person who was a masculine of center, masculine presenting um, young person who I met on Rikers and who was only 16 when we met. This is prior to the passage of Raise the Age. And so we were still seeing 16 and 17 year old children incarcerated on um, Rikers Island, one of the most notorious jails in the United States. This young person ended up in this system in large part because of the failures of her school and the broader New York City school school district and of course the failures of our country, right? So I wanna name some of the entry points because that's what helps us as attorneys and as practitioners understand where we need to be dismantling. The first entry point, I I would be remiss if I did not start with the fact that she um, was born where she was born, in a low-income neighborhood in Queens, New York. Where a young person is born, the um, socioeconomic status of their family in many ways will dictate the quality of education that they have access to, and it will dictate whether or not they attend a school where they are met with social workers, guidance counselors, love and affirmation, or they are met with police, metal detectors, and teachers who do not see their value or see them as human. Then we also recognize that the schools in um, this young person's neighborhood were not well-funded. New York City has over a million students, and we understand that in this very moment this year, the New York City um, School Safety Division has a budget of over $451 million. New York City doesn't even spend a quarter of that on school-based social workers or guidance counselors or restorative justice practitioners, but they spend almost half a billion dollars each year to employ the one of the largest police forces in the United States that is deployed specifically to New York City schools. And of course, this young person attended one of those schools. And what I learned, and I took it upon myself to work with this young person's mom, um, their mom was not always doing the best job of affirming their gender or their sexuality and what that causes for them to be pushed out of the home and involved in what people would call gang activity. And in my observation and in my direct communication, building a rapport, building a relationship with this young person, that was in large part because that community made them feel like they were at home and gave them the support and the care that they needed and wanted. And their parent did not always have the support that she would have liked or needed to understand how to connect with her young person. I, this young person attended a school, and I won't name the school, but I you know, have never had such a visceral reaction to educators who did not see or hear her or value her. She attended a school where she was one of very few Black students. And moreover, I want to point out the ways that being a darker skinned Black student also increased the likelihood this student was going to experience violence and harm. Harvard University has data around colorism that Black people who are darker skin are more likely to experience um, more severe punishment even for when you control for the crime. And so her being a massive center, 
uh, low income, dark skin, black student um, affected how she was treated. And so what happened is I had to witness the most horrible surveillance video that I ever saw where um, she was attending school and um, was at a school that um, was neighboring her trying to play basketball and a adult teacher, white teacher, confronted her and said, you're not supposed to be here. This isn't the time, you know, you're not supposed to be here. And she cussed as a teacher, which of course might be inappropriate, but that is very much aligned with adolescent brain development to um, be defiant or even disrespectful. Disrespect should not, should not meet a student with um, punishment. And so the teacher said, you know, did you, you know, disrespect me or curse at me? And then um, the student ran away. And this school sent I want to say, and I'm remembering the surveillance video, four school safety agents, which in New York City are cops, to grab this, chase the student, grab her, and drag her. I saw the video with my own eyes, drag her back into the building. And from there, a vicious cycle began. Um, there were criminal charges filed for this and other incidents, and it just became a snowball. And when we talked, to, when I talked to the principal, the school never offered this young person basketball or an opportunity to play for the basketball team. The student was interested in um, rap and poetry, never gave them access to any of those types of extracurriculars, and never also made any space for um, ident their identity and for them to identify um, as queer or trans and be a part of a student organization. And we see that this anecdote um, really does paint the picture of what I see broader across um, the public school system, which is that schools see black youth as a threat, something that must be controlled, someone that must be pinned, caged, and taken away rather than a person who is deserving of love and care and protection. That story um, is something that I think should help illustrate the ways that this is a snowball effect because once that student got arrested, you can imagine what that means for the rest of their lives. So they're absent from school for months. They miss months of school as a result of this incident. And we see this play out over and over again. The data shows that um, University of uh, Chapel, excuse me, University of North Carolina has very clear data that students who have a black teacher are much more likely to be successful across all races. Um, black, the presence of black teachers are a really crucial aspect of this. And we have to understand what does this mean for us as lawyers? How can we practice um, law in a way that is anti-racist and that allows us to look for opportunities to um, just increase diversity in the field of education, to litigate for fair funding in schools, and to remove policing and criminalization from schools more generally. Um, the cycle also continues even when the young person has not done anything wrong. Most people will know about the incident of four young girls in Binghamton, New York in 2019 who were punished. They were strip searched and one student was suspended for refuse, for laughing, for giggling. They were middle school students, which means they were 11 years old and they were walking down the hallway coming from lunch, giggling and being happy and being children. And instead of being greeted with care and support, the assistant principal made the false assumption that they must have been using some type of drug to make them behave so happily and giddily. And I think that this is a point that Dr. Blake also pointed about the, the stereotypes that educators hold about Black youth. And Karen also pointed this out about what people think about Black womanhood being strong and sturdy and not human or childlike, right? And so those four girls um, were pulled into the nurse's office. Three were forced to disrobe all the way into their underwear. And one, refused to disrobe and she was suspended for doing that. And but for organizers in Binghamton, New York, raising awareness about this happening, we would never have had any protection for those middle school girls. The final um, anecdote that I want to share, and Dr. Blake referenced this, is statistically Black girls have more adult caregiving responsibilities. And so what that means is a Black girl um, might be more likely to be responsible for taking younger siblings to school or picking them up from school, preparing meals. Um, our data at Girls for Gender Equity points out that Black girls are more likely to experience school-based sexual harassment school, and then sexual harassment in their community as they walk down the street, um, being catcalled, what we call street harassment. And so if you come into school and you're exhausted because you've already had to feed a younger sibling, take the bus or the train, and you've already been catcalled a number of times, and you're exhausted, and then when you get to school, the metal detector or the 
police who are standing are saying, take off your scarf. You don't wear a scarf. Take off that bonnet. Yelling at you. And you're just trying to do the best you can to show up at school. And so for the young people who um, gave testimony, actually, um, at a Breaking the Silence time hall hosted by the African American Policy Forum, they shared those experiences. And when what that tells us is that young people are carrying responsibilities, but schools punish them for that. And so if she's a little bit late because she was dropping a younger sibling off, or if she wants to put her head down because she's exhausted from taking on adult caregiving responsibilities, instead of saying, you need to get out of my classroom, or you should be punished for putting your head down, schools should be affirming and supporting those young people. And I would, I think I put this in the materials, but I would highly encourage the listeners to look at Dr. Monique Morris's book, Push Out. There's a an accompanying documentary push out. And of course, another legal scholar, Andrea Ritchie, who's done a great deal of research and writing about police sexual misconduct. At Girls for Gender Equity, we understand policing as a form of sexual violence. Police in New York City and across the country have been a part of numerous incidents of sexual violence and sexual harassment. And Dr. Andrea Ritchie, excuse me, uh, Andrea Ritchie, the attorney, her work points out um, police violence against Black women in particular. Um, and so I can drop some of these sources in the link, um, some of these links into the chat. But I want to just point out and sort of round out this picture about there are multiple systems. So that's underfunding of schools, policing and criminalization of schools, racist practices that take place in schools, and then also the criminal legal system not seeing Black girls as children, as people deserving of protection, but instead people who must be controlled. The presence of police in schools, I cannot emphasize enough, are extremely harmful and dangerous, and the data bears that out. The schools where you see, where you see police are schools where you see Black and Latinx students overwhelmingly, and that is not because Black or Latinx students are more dangerous or more violent. It is because many schools and political leaders have accepted the idea that they are more dangerous or more violent and have held on to ideas from the war on drugs that schools and low-income neighborhoods need to be controlled rather than pouring resources into guidance counselors, social workers, educators, restorative justice practitioners, rather than hiring more Black teachers, more Latinx teachers. And so again and again, we see these issues happening, um, and I'm happy to share additional resources. Great. Thank you so much. Um, you've given us a lot to think about in terms of, you mentioned the vicious cycle and how it keeps going. Um, and you in particular mentioned incarceration, you know, getting arrested. Um, and then unfortunately too many girls moving from school to police precincts. Um, and then sometimes actually to jails, to detention centers. And so that's what Dr. India Tusi is going to talk about. Um, you know, what does that look like for Black girls who we know from Dr. Blake have been adultified um, and uh, what happens to them once they leave school in these kinds of violent incidents? Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to thank the Education and the Law Committee of the NYC Bar Association, particularly uh, its co-chair, Jaron James, for inviting me to participate in this program. Thank you to my fellow speakers for your thoughtful remarks, tough acts uh, to follow and for the contextualization of this um, important issue. And, and Karen, just for being an inspirational um, young person, a brilliant young person, thank you for just allowing us to share this space with you, know, with you and be, uh, allowing us to enter into um, this world. Um, so we've heard from several of the speakers how various actors in the education system um, facilitate the systemic push out and discrediting of black girls. Racially biased perceptions that black girls are older than they are, as Dr. Blake was saying, um, that they are more defiant or that they are less reliable and trustworthy as we heard from um, you know, Karen's experiences have all contributed to their systemic marginalization at schools. The previous speakers have covered these topics in depth and I'm gonna speak about what happens to black girls once they have been processed through the system and adjudicated as delinquent, particularly focused on how their bodies are violated when they are incarcerated. There's a common theme that is you know, emerging from all of these um, remarks and the ways that at different points of the system, black girls are regularly disrespected and their bodies are subject to heightened surveillance and discipline. At the same time, 
what we've you know been experiencing as this social movement at this moment and you know in particular the me too movement has exposed the pervasiveness of sexual violence and sexual exploitation by powerful actors we learned about hollywood producers famous actors and corporate executives who have abused their power to sexually exploit people however one of the critiques of the movement is that is focused on spaces occupied by upper class and middle class women while ignoring the sexual exploitation of working class and poor women and girls and black indigenous and people of color communities in particular. This oversight is pronounced in the failure to mobilize around the sexual violence perpetuated by the criminal and juvenile legal system. These systems exercise total dominion over the bodies of those it subordinates once people are adjudicated as delinquent or incarcerated and they managed to make pervasive sexual violence and exploitation seem normal. See, unwanted touching and display of private parts are common features of life for incarcerated girls, evident through the non-consensual touching of their bodies when they enter detention facilities. We even heard an account earlier about the ways that a strip search was used to discipline girls in the school environment, right? So these practices are especially troubling when you consider that black and indigenous girls are disproportionately represented in juvenile detention facilities. The placement rate for indigenous girls is 132 per 100,000 indigenous girls. The placement rate for black girls is 110 per, for, per um, 100,000 black girls. For white girls, by contrast, the placement rate is only 32 per 100,000 white girls. So these racial disparities mean that the government, the state disproportionate, disproportionately incarcerates and then sexually assaults through unwanted and invasive searches, um, black and indigenous girls. So these girls, they're like their ancestors, their bodies are becoming sites for conquest, dominion and discipline. Mandating invasive searches is a particularly gendered form of traumatization that enacts for all girls and reenacts for many girls who have experienced a past sexual trauma at a moment where they're reliving that trauma again. Now the state in this context is supposed to be acting in the best interest of these girls, at least that's the legal standard. And rehabilitation is supposed to be the primary goal of the juvenile system unlike the adult system that focuses on deterrence and retribution. Now, courts recognize that girls cannot be reduced to their worst, worst decisions. So there is a deliberate focus on rehabilitating children who make mistakes rather than punishing them. And given the racial bias that led to these girls being in the system, it's really doubtful that they should even be incarcerated to begin with. But girls are often incarcerated for status offenses and petty offenses that we've already heard about, such as being disobedient in school. Yet detention facilities subject adjudicated girls to routine and invasive searches that are traumatizing and anything but restorative. These searches include blanket strip search policies for all girls when they are admitted into facilities, frisk searches at the discretion of correctional officials while they are in facilities, and strip searches when they have visits with their families and attorneys. A Human Rights Watch report recounted several incarcerated girls' experiences with invasive searches. So one girl reported, quote, you get a pat down after eating and a pat in certain classes. They pat search when something was missing. They'd strip you when you went across the yard, even to the dentist at the boys' side. You get strip search anytime you have shackles and handcuffs on. It feels like a violation. Another girl stated, when they are stripping us out, just derogatory comments or just being rude, they grab your boobs and it just was not okay with me. Now these searches are insensitive to the sexual exploitation that they facilitate. Some girls describe invasive searches as triggering memories of past incidents of sexual abuse. Under any other circumstance, Forcefully stripping children to nudity and requiring that they submit themselves to routine physical touching against their will would be rape. However, when the state does it, the detention centers have described it as protecting penological interests. Government officials claim that the unwanted touching is necessary to maintain the safety of juvenile detention centers. As a result of these practices, girls, 
a low risk population based on the offenses that they're generally incarcerated for. So it's these low level offenses like disobedience. They experience routine touching and bodily exposure despite being high risk for sexual exploitation. So this, this outcome is perverse. One girl who was routinely strip searched at a sacramental facility after running away from home described the experience. I'd have to bend over and squat and cough. It was humiliating. That's my body I'm shown to other human beings. Several courts have considered the constitutionality of these invasive searches. Now courts have generally upheld these searches as constitutional in, in light of the penological interest in preserving safety and detention center. However, these, search, these cases fail to consider the unique backgrounds of adjudicated girls that make blanket and routine invasive touching different and unreasonable as compared to ship searches of incarcerated adults, which also, honestly, I think are also generally unreasonable. Strangely, courts justify search practices that trigger PTSD. So for many girls, they've recounted having these memories that are trigger PTSD and memories of sexual abuse in children as being for these children's own safety, although the state has a duty to act in the best interest of these children, including protecting their mental health. So is it not child abuse when a child, when a parent routinely peers at their teenager's nude body and rubs it in search for contraband? But when the state is the parent under the doctrine of parents patri, Courts seem to ignore the perverse nature of peering at children's naked bodies on a regular schedule. The current Fourth Amendment jurisprudence and strip searches of incarcerated children suggest that such actions are, are reasonable. But this case law is deficient and would benefit from serious consideration of the unique circumstances of incarcerated girls, the ways that they're funneled into the system, the racial disparities, the fact that many of them are being placed into the system after these minor encounters in schools. Girls experience many bodily changes as they go through adolescence, which may prompt insecurity and feelings of inadequacy, requiring them to reveal their developing bodies to strangers and to allow these strangers to pat down their bodies for failing to comply with society's norms is abusive. Blanket strip search and invasive search policy are fundamentally at odds with the state's role in acting in the best interests of children. Now, girls must endure these regular body cavity searches, strip searches, and invasive pat downs while incarcerated when they go to the doctor, go to the library, visit their attorneys, or go to the dentist, depending on what facility they're in. Now these unwanted searches, I would argue, are actually sexual assaults, at least that's what they would be in any other context. And I think it's time to abolish a system that enacts such violence on children. Thanks. Thank you so much. I think it's um, easy for all of us to kind of lose sight of these consequences um, for girls who are whisked away, taken to detention centers, taken to jails. Um, you know, it's not an experience that gets talked about nearly enough. So thank you for shining a light on that disturbing practice. Um, I want to, for all of our attendees, turn back for a minute to CLE niceties. Um, so code number two, code number two is BAR030411. That's BAR030411. Um, so now that we've gotten really kind of, I think a, a very complex picture has been painted by all of our panelists um, from Dr. Blake, who gave us some of the historical background as well as some of the psychological research. Um, and of course we heard from Karen Amey about her personal experience from Ashley Sawyer about how this all kind of comes together in a way that um, ultimately harms too many black girls. And then also from India Tusi about the consequences, the really serious harms that are perpetrated by black girls being adultified, black girls being pushed into our criminal legal system. Um, so for the group, I wanted to pose a couple of questions. Um, first, what do you see as the biggest gap in knowledge that is preventing long lasting change? What are some of the forces that are making us have to deal with all of this? Um, is there some kind of gap in knowledge that you think exists and needs to be filled um, to make sure that we can stop this kind of violence 
and this kind of harm. Uh, Ashley, I see your mouth moving, but I think you might be muted. My apologies, thank you for recognizing that. I was saying that one of the things that I've um, seen both in my practice experience and um, through the legal research that I have done, one of the biggest gaps of knowledge that we have to acknowledge is what is the work to, to dismantle institutional and systemic racism. And while I know that the legal pedagogy that most of us receive is about contracts and torts and property, when you are in the position of practicing law with human beings, there are um, pieces of our own internalized biases that we have to unpack. And there isn't one particular course to do this, but anytime there are people interacting with young black children and they have not actively engaged in anti-racist work, they are perpetuating harm. I cannot say that in a more friendly or loving way because it is just true. I think that in the example of some of the attorneys who have come into contact with the young people that I've represented, in the example of the school police, even their educators, as Dr. Blake mentioned, there is deeply, deeply rooted anti-blackness, transphobia and homophobia in the way that they carry out their duty, such that black students are going to be scrutinized at a higher level than other students. Black children, whether they are outside on the street playing, are held to a different standard. And that is because of the inherent practices of, of anti-blackness throughout um, all of our systems. And I think that without the um, field, the legal field, making real strides towards anti-racist um, anti work, we will continue to see some of these themes harms perpetuated. And personally, I would argue that we need to be dismantling these systems more generally. And I think there are um, plenty of pieces of research that I can share with you about looking at all of this through a more anti-carceral abolitionist lens. But until we get to that moment, um, I really did want to make sure that I pointed out that despite anyone's best intentions, and I think I've heard this with every attorney that I've met, every uh, school police officer that I've encountered, they believe that they have good intentions and they believe that good intentions are enough to surmount the hurdles created by structural, institutional, and interpersonal racism. And that is simply not possible. Um, and so I cannot emphasize that, that enough. And what would it look like if we were to mandate more anti-racist work, if we were to ensure more black educators and find legal avenues to allow schools to intentionally select more black educators um, and to in do intentional work to reverse engineer the racist practices that are taking place in their schools. And I think lawyers should be thinking more creatively about how do we, within the confines of perhaps Title VII, um, do that work. May I, oh, go ahead, India, I'm sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. I was just going to add that I struggle with how much of this is a knowledge versus acceptance, right? So I think that, yes, we're providing some illuminating data that, oh, I didn't know that Black girls would experience adultification bias as young as five. But if we really reflect on an introspective, right, we're aware of the pervasiveness of stereotypes to Black women. We're aware of our biases and how... Um, we kind of make these snap judgments and perceptions in our everyday life. This is, there's decades and decades of work across disciplines, education, social psychology, counseling psychology. You know, I mean, even with some of my work, I'm, I'm looking at legal reviews and legal studies where they're capturing this. So I don't think this is about knowledge. I think this is about, um, I tell my students, you know, the human condition is, how much do you give up of, of what you have to impact the greater good? How much do you inconvenience yourself to do what's right for other people? And this is what we struggle with. So I don't think this is not a, a gap in knowledge at this point. Um, Google's a powerful thing. You know, I always tell, tell my kids, Google it and then Google it 10 more times and check the credibility of those sources. So we, if anything, we are, we have so much knowledge. We have so much information. The, the issue is acceptance, right? And are we willing to sacrifice our conveniences? And I say our, because I don't think it works to demonize anyone because we're all, you know, we're all collectively connected, right? But there are some people who have more power, legitimate authority. And there are some people who have 
privileges, right? Like social power, right? So are we willing to give up some of our ways of thinking and the luxuries that were provided to dismantle these systems and the inequity that Black girls are experiencing? I think that's the question. That's the challenge that we are faced with. Um, and I think that we can move past this idea of a knowledge gap. I don't think it's a knowledge gap anymore. Yeah, I, I, I really agree with that. And I, I was going to say something kind of similar. I guess m my remark kind of ties both, you know, Ashley's and Dr. Blake's remarks in that, you know, there are, I do think perhaps, you know, there is some um, concern about how to actually tackle the solution. But I, I do agree with Dr. Blake that the knowledge of the actual problem is, is probably there. And if, if you indulge me for a second, I want to kind of illustrate that point with an analogy. So, you know, I remember many years ago, I think I was either a child or a teenager and I was watching some movie awards ceremony and the comedian who was hosting the show made some joke about how none of the actresses in the room would want to be alone with Harvey Weinstein. And, you know, it was alluding to his reputation of being a creep and the fact that maybe these actresses would know that he would be sexually exploitive in some way. And the audience at the time laughed. It was just a joke, right? So there was such great awareness about it that, you know, they knew that it was a joke, right? And I even learned about it, even though I was, you know, thousand miles away in New York, a child um, at the time, far away from Hollywood. Yet it took close to a couple decades later before he would be held accountable for this conduct. So I think oftentimes awareness of the problem isn't the issue, it's the political will to actually do something about the problem, right? The fact that you know it was this widespread open secret, yet people did not address it. So turning it back to our conversation, I think the question is interesting because I, I agree, I don't think there's a knack of knowledge that you know Black girls have been experiencing all these racially biased outcomes at schools. I think there's a lack of action, perhaps a lack of political will to do something about the problem. You know, as Dr. Blake was saying earlier in remarks that there are many reports on this issue, decades of research, you know, Black girls have shared their stories, but the problem gets reduced to these individual acts with individual bad actors rather than systemic marginalization of girls. Right? And so we read these stories in the news, the media might hype up one individual story, people will get angry for a moment and just pass away, but do nothing about it. Right? And so then complacency just sets in and it happens again. Right? And so I guess you know, part of the question is, why isn't there <laughs> the political will to actually address this issue when we know that this is a problem, we see that there's a problem, we have all this data showing that there's a problem, why does it just get reduced to these individual accounts? And I think you know, what Dr. Blake was alluding to is you know, perhaps there's this perception that if we do something for this, I must give up something, right? So the scarcity mindset, right? And you know, what do I gain from actually helping out Black girls in the system? And I think that that's partially right, right? In terms of you know, what might be um, you know, creating this lack of motivation to actually address the issue. But I, I don't think it's necessarily a problem with knowledge or maybe there's a, a problem around, you know, not knowing how to deal with the problem. So it's a problem around, you know, the solution. But I think, you know, there's some awareness that there, there are issues. And, you know, we see these accounts, we see them in social media, we see them in the popular media. Yeah, and one thought that uh, your comments, all of your comments together bring to mind is um, the idea that some of these issues have been uh, out there for a long time. Some of us have experienced them ourselves. Um, but really naming them, I think, has a lot of power. So I think even just hearing the term from Dr. Blake, adultification bias, I think probably a lot of people haven't heard that before, um, even though, you know, the dynamic, the, the lived experience that a lot of us have had says that that's true. Um, and it's something maybe we've experienced ourselves. We see maybe people in our families experience it. We've seen other people experiencing it. But um, attaching that label to it can be extraordinarily powerful. Um, so thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you for your research. Um, thank you to all the panelists for really putting it all together because it is so easy for all of us to reduce it down to, oh, you know, this person just had a bad experience with this teacher or, you know, there's just a bad day or something like that. Um, but it really does seem clear that when you look at it all together, the data again and again and again reveals this is not just about individual stories. Um, you know, it's not just about 
interpersonal relationships that went awry, there's really something systemic um, going on here. Um, and I did just want to comment because I do see a number of questions that are in the chat um, and I hope we'll be able to get to a good number of them. Um, but before we do that, I did just want to ask all the panelists um, if you care to comment. Um, you don't have to, but I really, I think we all benefit from your expertise. Um, you know, if you could name one or two things that you wanted to see change to make the experience of black girls in schools better, particularly when it comes to policing in schools, um, what would they be? Um, for me, I would say two things that I'd want to see changed and to make us feel more welcome and less like we're being like surveyed. I would say one first thing would be asking us how we feel about things and asking us what we need instead of deciding that backhanded compliments and telling us, complimenting us for being strong are all you need to do to support black women. Um, so definitely like asking us how we feel about things in relation to ourselves, instead of asking us to speak up for other people and requiring less emotional labor from us because people really do feel entitled to black women's labor like we're expected to do things just because but with everyone else it's a paid opportunity and they're doing you a big favor but with us it's like we're expected to so asking us how we feel about things instead of speaking over us the one time we should be allowed to speak and just yeah. That's important. Thank you. Any other panelists want to jump in? One or two top of your wish list for how you would start to address these very complex issues. So this is so hard because I don't want to give you one or two. Like I want to give you like 10, right? But, um, you know, the over-policing, you know, in the school context, obviously, right, is um minimize i mean so simply saying right remove school resource officers from schools right and i'm gonna piggyback it and replace that with mental health professionals right and so that we're only looking at cases that really are severe crime or violence where they're intervening and not these low level um subjective offenses um but you know, the other thing is I think we need to rethink our curriculum to make sure it's we have more um, ethnic studies, gender studies. We need to be like re-educating kids and at the same time re-educating educators, right? So that we have a more inclusive, you know, curriculum because I think that as Ashley put it, well put, it's, it's not one area. These things are intricately linked, right? It's complex and they're building blocks. It's underfunded schools. It's not curriculum that is inclusive of a variety of diversities. It's teachers who lack preparation on, on understanding, you know, children. So it's hard to whittle these down to two things because, and I, and I know that's what we want to do as human beings because we, it's easier to focus, you know, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time, but complex issues require complex solutions. And you, you can't necessarily tease one piece apart and think that you're going to solve what is, as uh, Dr. Fusi noted, a systemic problem. So it's hard for me to kind of prioritize that, but I definitely think um, removing uh, police officers and, and rebranding them and, and telling them what they really are and not this package of, we're here as a support system, which is disingenuous and spurs greater distrust for kids. Like kids know that this is not the case and that makes them even less likely to believe in these authority figures. I will jump in here. Uh, I will follow Karen's lead. Karen asked us to listen. So I just dropped it into the chat feature, but in 2017, Girls for Gender Equity led a participatory action research process, which is essentially a research process where the people who um, are part of the researchers are people who are impacted by the issue. And the young people from New York City Public Schools who engage in this process came up with this report called The School Girls Deserve, and they outlined five things that they wanted to see happening in order for them to feel 
safe, affirmed, and included in their academic environment. And this is from the perspective of um, cis and trans girls and non-binary youth of color in New York. Um, one of the things that is most salient and at GGE, I am actively involved in a campaign for police free schools. There's a national network. Um, so some people may know Los Angeles just won their effort to remove police from schools. And I wanna say about 20 other school districts have done it over the past few six months, have uh, made efforts to not only remove police from schools, but reinvest those resources in the types of programs and systemic changes that create positive school climate. So in the case of New York City, we would need to take the almost half a billion, you heard me say half a billion, $451 million that is allocated each year for school policing and reinvest that into restorative practices and restorative justice practitioners, which are not just people who put young people in a circle. It is a deeply comprehensive system and worldview that needs to be implemented in schools, invest in the hiring and retention of Black educators. The young people from the School Girls Deserve Report identified a need for culturally affirming um, curricula. They believe that they did not see themselves represented in their curricula and as, as a result did not feel engaged in school. They wanted to end school-based sexual harassment and assault, and that means comprehensive sexual health education that teaches young people about consent. And again, I cannot emphasize enough, the young people said it, the research says it, police free schools. When we reinvest those resources that are poured needlessly into criminalization of youth instead of community schools, which can provide um, resources like housing, meals, nutrition, uh, job programs for young people, that is what reduces violence and harm. There's no data backing that the idea that the presence of police reduces the incidence of violence. In fact, it actually exacerbates those incidents. Um, police are more likely to escalate situations and there's no training in the world that is going to take someone trained as a law enforcement officer and make them a social worker or a restorative justice practitioner. So we need to reinvest those resources and really listen to what young people and organizers have called for across the country. Um, and that I think is just a part of a bigger puzzle, recognizing that these systems are existing in a big, bigger ecosystem ecosystem of systemic racism and transphobia and violence, right? Like we cannot have anti-racist schools when we live in a racist city or state or country. And so there's dismantling that has to happen across systems, but I will really emphasize the need to invest in healing and safety for schools and to divest from criminalization. Thank you. And anyone else wanna jump in one or two things? No, India? I, I agree with everything everyone said. Um, remove police from schools, affirm Black history and Black culture, find services that students want and need, and listen to the students. Great, thank you. Um, so there are a lot of great questions that are in the Q and A. Um, I think. Ashley, in your comments, you just answered one of them, which was, uh, what is the state of community mobilization around these issues? Um, and particularly, you know, the idea of getting rid of police in schools, divesting from policing in schools. Um, you talked about how that is taking shape in some communities around the country. Um, and that is very good to know about. Um, I did wanna direct one question to, um, Dr. Tutsi, which is about what lawyers can do. So you talked about some precedents, some bad, bad precedents, and if you believe in, you know, bodily autonomy and uh, the Fourth Amendment. <laughs> so, in light of what can, can lawyers do, anything in light of those bad precedents? I mean, I think there's some still some spaces, and you know, I'm currently working on an article that um, kind of examines some of the doctrinal possibilities. So whether in the Fourth Amendment context, I do think there's, although, the, you know, the, there's only been a few courts that have actually addressed this issue. So I think it's about um, four or so circuit courts that have addressed it. So perhaps litigation in other courts might be an avenue if you have the right case. Um, I think also, you know, putting forth, um, you know, a full picture of the, of, of the context for 
um, girls who are being uh, put into the system. So introduced into empirical research where the court has um, adopted or at least acknowledged the importance of empirical research for um, young people in other contexts and saying that, you know, in the Fourth Amendment context, when we're looking at these searches, um, that empirical research is also relevant. And so some of the relevant research might include the fact that, you know, so many um, girls who are incarcerated have experienced sexual assaults and trauma prior to the incarceration. And so when we're examining the reasonableness of the search, we have to factor that in. Um, look at the uh, research that shows that it can be re-traumatizing as being relevant in evaluating the Fourth Amendment reasonableness of a search. I think there's some you know, possibilities, although you know the few cases uh, or the few courts that have actually addressed that issue at the circuit court level, um, I don't think have done a great job with it. I do think there's some possibilities after some recent um, jurisprudence in the Eighth Amendment context that's, you know, where the court is really embracing the empirical research. So I think there's possibilities for legal advocacy, you know, finding the right circuit for it, and then, you know, bringing the, the right case, you know, which is kind of the case with any sort of, um, at least, um, I guess, like impact litigation. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, another question. So I'm hearing a lot of talk about really abolition from all of you. So I think I know the answer to this question. But somebody asked, um, businesses, law firms, and government agencies have been mandating training sessions about systemic and implicit racial, gender, and other biases. Do you have any data or experience to say when these trainings are effective and when they are not? And I guess I'll just add on to that. Do you think trainings like that are useful in this context? Is that a potential answer, perhaps short of abolition and removing police from schools? So I think Ashley really spoke to this. And I think that these one and done trainings where you come in for an hour, like again, right, like complex uh, problems deserve complex, you know, solutions, right? And so these, these trainings, while well intended and well meaning, are usually not sufficient in duration or quality. Um, and they don't allow for generalization of behaviors to result in actual change in practice, right? So it's it's not just, hey, I sat in this training and now I have all this knowledge and I'm going to do this. What happens oftentimes is people sit in the training, they listen, they might be engaged or not engaged depending on how they feel about the topic, right? And if there's no mechanism of accountability, they get up and they go back to what they were doing. So I think that there's mixed findings about this, um, about whether implicit bias trainings really work and how effective they are. I think it depends on how the training is done and we have to do more research on it, but the trainings that I think a lot of these organizations are getting are not meant to sustain and result in actual behavioral change. And the way you do that is you have to have some mechanism of accountability. People have to take you know, it can't just be one hour, right? And it can't be one training. It has to be kind of this process where there's accountability. We're going back to our, our agency and we're doing work. We're looking at our policies and our practices. We're creating teams. We're applying this knowledge um, in a daily or monthly kind of organized format. And to my knowledge, I don't know if the other panelists have different experiences, that doesn't happen in any institution or system that I'm aware of. So um, the short answer is the research is mixed on this, but I don't think that the trainings are structured enough to allow for sustained behavioral change, let alone policy change. Any other comments on trainings and their potential value in this context? Okay, um, there's one question that was directed to Karen, um, if you're still there which was about, you spoke so eloquently about your experiences in high school um, and how challenging some of them were. And someone was wondering if things are better now that you're in college. Um, hmm. I think that things are less sugar-coated in college. I don't think they're necessarily better because I feel like high school and the educational system in general is a pretty good microcosm of life as a black woman. But um, the thing with my high school was they operated under like a fake concept of like wokeness and social awareness. So everything was kind of very 
very coded, very passive aggressive and very like concealed, I would say. College is kind of like, my professors will straight up tell me during a history class that they're gonna say the N-word just because they feel inclined to do so because it's part of the history and people were saying it back in the day. And they won't care about the comfort of their black students. So I think it hasn't improved. It's just been more apparent to me. Like I don't have to be as observant to see it. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm sorry to hear that, um, but appreciate again, your willingness to um, share your experiences with all of us. Um, there are two more questions I kind of want to combine into one um, for the panelists. So one is about um, adultification of black girls not happening just at the hands of non-black educators, non-black police officers, um, but black girls being adultified by you know, older black people in our own community. Um, and someone else asked about uh, how non-black educators and others can be allies to black girls. But you know, based on the first part, I think that actually has to be extended to all of us. Um, black girls need allies among black and non-black educators um, and other adults who are in girls' lives, girls' lives. So please, does anyone have thoughts on that? Um, what can allies do? People who are listening, who um, you know, are maybe thinking about some of this for the first time, maybe not. Um, what can we do to be allies to black girls, all of us? Karen, I think I saw your hand up. Yeah, um, I have some thoughts on that. And my opening thought would be the best way to be an ally to black girls is to, first of all, you have to look inwards because the way I think about it, every non-black person is racist until they unlearn racism. So if you had parents who were here while segregation was going on, for example, a lot of our politicians were raised in segregated schools and they were taught by racist parents. All of that generational racism is passed down. So until you unlearn that racism, you can't truly be an ally because you haven't checked yourself fully. For example, politicians tend to say that like they're in support of the black community, but they haven't unlearned what they learned in those segregated schools. So they're still thinking and operating passively with the means of racism. So first step, I would definitely say purchasing books on unlearning racism listening to black women again i can't stress how important listening to black women is ask us what we need allow us to tell you how to help us but ask us we shouldn't have to solicit help and help shouldn't be administered in a way that makes us feel like we have to sugarcoat and thank them for doing something they're supposed to be doing so that's the first thing. Definitely the second thing is when you see your non-Black peers expecting and requiring emotion, more emotional labor than they require from other people from Black women, check them, stop them. Tell them, hey, um, I've noticed Karen is doing a lot of this work. So maybe we sh someone else should contribute. She shouldn't have to carry the load of this work. Or, hey, Alexa shouldn't have to speak in every group presentation and represent everyone else. Hey, this person shouldn't be required to do all of this. Basically just allowing us to rest. That's something as a black woman, which is so funny to me because people stereotype us as angry black women, but it's never anger, it's frustration because we are exhausted. So definitely, listening to us on learning racism and checking other people when they require unpaid or unappreciated emotional labor. We don't owe, Black women do not owe anybody emotional labor. So when Black women say, hey, I'm not going to teach you how not to be racist, instead of getting snappy and saying, oh, well, I guess I don't have to learn about this because you're not giving it to me nicely and you're not spoon feeding it to me 
let's go, hey, you're right. You shouldn't have to be that emotional neighbor. I'll take it on. I'll explain to this person why this is wrong. I'll let you rest. Let us rest. I'm gonna say you're so much wiser than I was when I was in college. Just so much wiser, so much. Thank you so much for your wisdom and sharing your wise words. Anybody else wanna jump in? I saw a lot of head nods going on. Yeah, Dr. Blake. So I wanna address the two points. I wanna address the first one about how does um, black people or other people of color, how does, it, how does their adultification, right, of black girls impact what we see? And so again, what I tell my students often is, you can't live in the United States. You can't have grown up here without being subject to the stereotypes and racism. So you will find that even black people, right, have internalized racism and have adopted these stereotypes and have biases amongst black children because we're all kind of inundated with them. And it's a conscious process. It's an unlearning, right? Like Karen said, that even we have to do. So I think that, so there's adultification as a socialization process, right? Where kids are um, having to take on household responsibilities because it keeps their, and um, Linda Burton really conceptualizes, it has to keep their household functioning, right? So there's this socialization process. But when I'm talking about the bias, right? I'm talking about you don't have that context and this is still how you receive black girls. And even if you have that context, just because someone is capable in one setting, doesn't mean that it automatically extends in another. You know as the educator, you are the adult. You have the cognitive sophistication to understand that, okay, even though this child is helping take care of their family, right, and, and helping their mom or their dad by cooking dinner or walking their siblings to school, this does not now mean that they have the cognitive ability and level of an adult, right? Developmentally, they're still a child, even though they've been taught to take on these responsibilities. Like, I, I think that sometimes as adults, we're not acting as adults and we're not using our um, intellectual functioning and our reasoning to really say, this is a child. It doesn't matter what their circumstances are. This is still a child and this is what they come in with. So, so yes, there are, you know, black people who have adultification bias and, you know, when I was growing up and even I have to stop myself, like, you know, my daughter wants to wear these short shorts. I'm like, you, you, that's too fast. And then of course she flips it back on me. Don't, are you falling to the patriarchy? Are you adultifying me right now? And I'm like, well, take them shorts off. Right. But I have to like really even check myself as someone who's researching this because these are the messages I was exposed to. And those messages were more of protection. Right. But I have to, um, kind of check myself. So that's that. And then the second thing is not to get philosophical, but I struggle with allyship because um, I really think we need to do a deeper dive about what this means because sometimes you have allies who end up taking over and becoming the voice of not just black people, all people of color. And you have to be very careful that, that to be an ally is all the things that Karen says, she's right. You know, you have to recognize what your biases are. You have to, you know, be able to have awareness of when, you know, a targeted group black girls are being discriminated against. But then there's this balance, right? You cannot become the voice and the face and the savior, you know, for black girls. And I think that's where I struggle with allyship is how do you support someone without becoming the face of their cause? Right. So when we talk about allyship, I think we need to unpack this a little bit more because people start to get confused that you can advocate for someone without um, to make sure that your advocacy is really in the benefit of the black girls and not for yourself. That's my concern about allyship is that sometimes allies, it starts to become more about them than it does about black girls. So like that's a deeper conversation, but that's one we need to have in the field because people are talking about being allies and they, they, they're, they're starting to use it for their own benefit. Even if it makes you feel better, that's not really helpful either, right? It's about making sure you put forth the voice of those girls and making sure that when you see things happening, right? Um, you know, the true allyship, the true bravery 
is when no one's watching, but you're with your colleagues and you sense discrimination, right? And have integrity and say, hey, why are you doing that? Why are you asking that question? It goes back to um, Dr. Busey's point of taking those political risks, right? Taking those social risks. That's what needs to happen for black girls. That's what you need to do, not in these, not in public spheres, but in private spheres. Ashley, did you want to add something? Yes, I just wanted to add something because I did, um, that question really resonates with me about Black educators perpetuating some of the same harmful um, ideology. And I think that's a broader, bigger conversation probably for another time. But um, I want to encourage um, us to really think about the practices that take place in schools and in community and in jails um, about control. Um, we see this in the family regulation system, which some people call the child welfare system, but the idea of controlling young people, controlling Black people, is pervasive and it obviously has its origins in the U.S. system of chattel enslavement. But what we see often is when we see girls um, not speaking when they're, when they're told that they're supposed to speak or speaking out of turn or wearing particular clothes, systems, and that includes teachers, um, law enforcement, often have the idea that I must control this young person. I must stop them from doing what they're doing. Um, and the data just doesn't bear out that that's helpful. And we know that young people's brains do not develop in fully until their mid-20s. And so often when they engage in behavior, even behavior that is harmful, it is better to allow them to learn than it is to say, I'm going to remove you from your home, remove you from your community, put you under probation supervision or surveil you or control you in some way. The data just shows over and over that that actually causes more harm to them and increases the likelihood that they will end up in the criminal system as an adult. And so I think of that carries also with um, educators who are people of color who have not done work to unpack their own internalized anti-Blackness or racism. A person of color does not make you um, automatically um, non-anti-Black, right? And also um, making sure that we do our own work to understand why is it that we feel like we have to control Black bodies. And that is obviously rooted in um, this country's history of controlling Black bodies. I think um, the most hor one of the most horrific examples that I can think of um, in my career was a case that got a little bit of headlines a few years ago of the young Black woman, Jasmine Headley, who was in an, um, a welfare office um, for hours upon hours waiting for assistance and was ignored. And so she sat on the floor and the police officer there, and this was a young Black woman, dragged her and ripped her baby from her arms, very much in the way that we saw Black women have their children ripped from their arms um, in enslavement. And so the idea that People can't even sit when they want to sit or stand when they want to stand. Or in the incident of the young girl in Spring Valley, South Carolina, put her head down on her desk when she wants to put her head down on her desk, that the idea that that, has, that behavior has to be controlled. The Spring Valley incident where, you know, that I just mentioned where the school cop grabbed that young girl who was sitting at her desk and slammed her to the ground, that was because she would not lift her head up or take her headphones out. That's not, she wasn't pre presenting a harm to the community. The educators in that room felt like she had to be controlled. She was doing something that they did not want her to do, and they felt like, I have to change her behavior, even though she was not doing anything harmful. And so um, until we're willing to unpack the ideas around power and control of young people and their bodies, their physical autonomy, we will continue to see the same criminaliza criminalization happen, even at the hands of educators of color. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to raise up one last thing from the Q&A before I turn it over to Jarian for some closing remarks. Um, someone mentioned the term misogynoir, um, which I imagine some listeners are familiar with and some are not. Um, is that a term that any of the panelists could define for our audience? Um, misogynoir is basically misogyny against Black women specifically. So it's kind of like, I was actually having this conversation with my boyfriend yesterday it's basically kind of like the isolated feeling that I was talking about. So it's like, we're kind of like attacked from all ends. We get excluded when it comes to like feminist movements and when it comes to women's rights movements. And then we get treated with misogyny when we go to the black community as well with the men. So it's just like, we don't really have anyone advocating for us because it's like we're not woman enough 
and we're also not black enough. We are kind of like isolated and forced to stand alone. And it's kind of like misogyny is one thing that people tend to deny. And racism is another thing that people tend to deny. Now imagine experiencing both of them at the same time and someone telling you that you're wrong for not being okay with it. Like, really? we, ex- and, oh, sorry. we experience racial gaslighting and we experience gaslighting as women as well. So it really makes us confused. It makes us feel isolated. It makes us feel like nobody's, nobody cares about us. Nobody's speaking up for us. Yeah, and I think, unfortunately, some of the issues we've been talking about this evening are really massage noir at its worst. Um, and so I wish we could end on a hopeful note, um, but I, I am hopeful about some of the movement that um, Ashley Sawyer talked about around the country. Um, and I'm hopeful that, you know, roughly 200 people showed up tonight to listen to these wonderful presentations, to talk about these important issues. Um, and I will turn it over now to Jerry and with a thank you to all the panelists for putting in the time um, and sharing their expertise. Thank you. Um, President Boston, thank you for your vision. Dr. Jamila Blake for setting the perfect foundation. Dr. India Tusi and Ashley Sawyer for making it clear that we can no longer ignore our Black girls. Professor Carter for steering this ship tonight. Karen, Amy, for your bravery, your vulnerability, and just telling it as it is. I am so proud. Thank you, ladies. Because of each of you, I am prouder to be a Black woman. Thank you. Um, Special thank you to Marta Harris from the NYCB who has helped me every step of the way, even during the program for this event. So thank you, Marta, the chairs and the committee members of the various co-sponsoring committees, especially my co-chair, Evan Rosenberg. Thank you, Emily Smith and Marissa Zanfordino for helping us with the CLE materials. Finally, but not least, Thank you so much to our audience for being here tonight. Thank you for staying all the way to the end. And the program went so well that our president would like to say one more thing before we go. So President Boston, over to you. Wow. Okay, thank you so much. I just want to thank all of our panelists, moderator, Jerry, and everyone. Um, You know, Ms. Karen stressed again and again, the importance of listening listening to black women and girls. And that's the purpose of this series. And I'm about to get emotional. It's important for the voices to be heard. You may not agree with what you've heard. You may disagree or agree with opinions that have been given, but it's important to listen. And it's important for us to have this conversation and to learn. I learned for the first time the phrase adultification bias. I hadn't heard it before. This isn't my field, but I thought it important for us to share with others and educate about it. My head is swimming. During the presentation, there were times I cried. There were points in the the presentation when I smiled and even laughed. But I just wanted to make sure that everyone knows the bar of hope, we are here, and we are trying to educate, and we are going to try to contribute in positive ways. So I need everybody to think about this. You know, the question was asked, well, is it about knowledge or is it about intentions? Frankly, I think it's both, but I hear you about, I shouldn't say intentions, actions. I think it's both. Um, I will just close this out with this quote because this is a woman whom I greatly admire. She's been an advocate for children She happens to be a black woman and I'm speaking of Marion Wright Edelman. This is a quote that I love and I just want to, for the bar of hope for our community, for those who are allies, want to be allies and we're learning and trying to deal with these convoluted issues. And as was earlier said, complex issues require complex solutions. Marion Wright Edelman said this and I just want you to take it to heart as we leave this evening. You really can change the world if you care enough. That's all I have to say. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Take care.
god bless, stay healthy.